Hi, sorry, everybody. A little emergency came up, so I'm actually on the road. But remember today to go outside in the sun, lift up your sleeves to the elbows, hike up your skirts, roll up your pants, and get at least 15 minutes a day of vitamin D to build and maintain a healthy immune system. I am so pleased and excited to introduce Mary Newcomb of Nishika. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Rivka, for that great introduction. I'm Miri, the beekeeper for Neshika, and we're here this morning in the bee yard. And in front of me, I've got a small beehive. There aren't any actual bees in it, except any that might be there by accident. Today, we're going to be talking about beeswax, propolis, and royal jelly. Those are called beehive products or hive products. We're going to go through them in some detail, but I wanted to give you a little tour of what it's like sort of inside a beehive. Okay, so inside this smaller hive, this could contain between five and six frames. See the frames are in here this way, and I'll show you a picture when we go inside of what they look like. So this is an empty frame. It's got wire on it. Uh, this is uh, where the bees will make their home. Here's phase two. Oh, we've actually got somebody checking it out. Oh, oh, she flew away. But this is what they make when left to their own devices. This is natural comb. I love that shape, the teardrop shape. And if you look very carefully, you can see a little bit of nectar inside of some of these cells. Now this is a frame with a beeswax base on it. It has little tiny hexagons. I have a picture I'm going to show you later inside of, of what these look like close up. Uh, we give them this because it's actually easier to care for the bees when they're more organized. And they actually appreciate the um, template, if you will, for building, building their wax, building their hive. Oh, this is some comb from an old hive. Notice the difference in color between that and that. So this is brand new. It's practically white. And this comb is probably three to four years old. And last but not least, I wanted to show you, dun, 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 dun. this is a flow frame. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the flow frame a lot but I wanted to show you that it fits inside of a normal frame. And I actually have another picture of one inside and uh, the bees use that too. I'll show you later, they, uh, they wax in between there. And it does a lot of the pre-work for them. Again, it's a template that they can use. Now we're gonna go over to the hives and actually see the bees inside the hive from the back, from the flow hive end. So this is our actual flow hive. Mm -hmm. And notice these dark spots here. This is propolis. The bees use that as as the glue, all-purpose cement, medicine, you name it. And we're gonna talk about that in a little while as well, but I wanted, to, I wanted you to see how they actually use it inside the hive. It's like all-purpose and it's super duper sticky. It's really, really sticky. It's, um, it's a little like tar. Here, we're gonna go look at one more and then Dave's gonna get a great shot, hopefully, of some bees inside here. Back, we can open these. This is all sealed off. Remember, they just sealed it with the polish here. Get out of Dave's way. Well, notice that the bees go in from either direction. So there, and also that they each one of these is a cell, and that they slope down ever so slightly. 
so the stuff doesn't spill out when I put it in. Because it's very runny when you first put it in. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, I'm going to head inside shortly. Hi again, everybody. Uh, we were waiting for a second video to upload, and it's rather robust, so we will save it for the end. Uh, again, thanks for having us today. We're going to talk a little bit about beeswax, propolis, and royal jelly. And I thought we would start a little bit with the structure inside the hive. You saw inside a beehive just moments ago, and this is a real important component here is how the cells are put together. They are hexagonally shaped and each of those frames is built on both sides. As you see, the cells are slanted ever so slightly downward at the back and they actually interlock at the back, which is very cool. It keeps the, the nectar from falling out or the sleeping bees from falling out or whatever they happen to be storing in there from falling out. So in this wonderful architecture of the honeycomb, there are three casts of bees, honeybees, that live there. Uh, the queen, she's the one on the left in that picture. The drone on the right, he's quite uh, chubby and has very big eyes. And the worker bee, who is also female. So the drones are male. The queen and the worker bees are all female. Uh, the drones are a minority and they're catered to a great deal. The reason I point this out is the size of the cell determines uh, what type of bee will grow there. Uh, drones need bigger cells <laughs> for obvious reasons. And the queen needs a very special kind of cell. And I'll post a picture of that just now. So again, here is a picture of uh, cells in real time. Uh, you'll see the one at the very bottom. There's a, an A, B, C, and D listed. D is an empty cell. Uh, C is a drone cell. Notice it's sort of poofy at the top. B are queen cells. They're, they uh, hang down and they're shaped somewhat like a peanut because the queen is larger than the others. And A is a picture of an actual larva inside a cell. Beeswax, we'll try and summarize a little bit. Uh, it's, it's produced by the bees. You will see some images eventually of bees producing that. They produce it from glands on their abdomen. Uh, only a short, time during their brief lifetime. So a honeybee leave, lives about six weeks and they only produce wax for between four and 10 days of that while they're being nurse bees. Uh, the jobs rotate within the hive. So they produce that wax, but they also repurpose that wax. They use it again and again and again. And the combs themselves, they use for all sorts of things. I refer to it as the machzan of the beehive. So as we know, beeswax has many uses and specific to uh, this particular audience, our friendly herbalists near and far. Uh, we'll talk about some of the properties of bees beeswax and some of the different things that you can do with it. And then we'll move on to other hive products. I'll also be including at the end of this session the list of all the references that I'm using for this. And there are some really good ones out there that I recommend everybody uh, check out. Some very good uh, sites, um, you know, scientific papers written about the properties of all three topics of today's talk. So as beeswax is used uh, medically or uh, one of the components is that it it's not water soluble. It dissolves partially in boiling alcohol and completely in chloroform and carbon disulfide, which I don't think either any of us are actually using right now. Uh, hot turpentine also. The, the bottom line is it 
it's very sticky uh, and it's very persistent. But one of the cool things about it is when you spread it, it actually forms a web. So unlike an oil on the surface of your skin, for example, the, the, the micro components inside of beeswax will form a web over your skin. So sort of like a, a Band-Aid or a gauze bandage that's uh, ever so slightly more flexible and of course then waterproof. So as I'm sure you're aware, beeswax is used in lots of ways cosmetically and I thought I'd try and shed some light on some of the different terminology that's used uh, in these different cosmetic products. Now, when I say cos cosmetic, I'm really talking about topical stuff you put on your skin. So what differentiates uh, this myriad of different topical applications of beeswax is basically the ratio of oils to beeswax. The components that beeswax really loan to any of these have to do with uh, the stability of it. So because beeswax itself doesn't rot, doesn't get fungal in any way, doesn't break down, it adds uh, stability and consistency. So in our cavalcade of topical applications, we have butters, creams, lotions, balms, salves, ointments, liniments, and soaps and scrubs. Balm salves or butter, the bottom line is knowing the ingredients and their intended use. No matter what you call them, every herbalist and product creator will have their own guidelines for which terms they use. I'm going to share with you my breakdown of what these different things are. I'd really like to know how you apply them in your various practices. Okay, so we're going to start with butters. Butters are basically liquid or solid fats. Uh, the majority of the ones we deal with are liquid fats. Those are oils, any sort of carrier oil almond oil, olive oil, any of those things that are runny at room temperature. There are also solid fats that can be used in butters, uh, shea butter, jojoba butter, depending on the time of year, coconut butter, or all of those as fats, not adulterated with anything else. The important thing about butters is they are anhydrous. There is no water in them. The consequence is they've got a really long shelf life. They're really moisturizing and a butter will melt on your skin. The consequence to that, it, it may have a slightly greasy or oily feeling on your skin, but there will still be a scant amount typically of beeswax added to those. Variations on butters, of course, include whipped butter and lotions and creams. So let's talk a little bit about lotions. Um, lotions are typically made with a base of prepared butters but you add water to them. Uh, and those can include hydrosols or herbal infused water, aloe vera, anything that's got a water content to it. And then you mix it into an emulsion. You're combining the water and the oil, which we know can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, lotions are usually a loose consistency and they're thinner in creams and they just contain a higher percentage of water. So balms, not unlike the word hoary, can be, <laughs> be uh, interpreted a variety of different ways. So this is my interpretation of the word balm. Uh, it's a fragrant ointment. They're made for topical application and have a smooth and oily consistency. They're thicker and harder than salves. They usually have a medicinal property or a healing property to them, like Jay Rifka mentioned earlier, uh, lip balm, one of my favorites. Uh, there's a higher wax ratio in, in balms, so obviously they're thicker and harder. Uh, and because of that wax ratio, high wax ratio, they have a protective barrier that will keep the moisture in 
or out, uh, keep the things dry, and lip balms are a great example of that. Now we come to a category I refer to as salves, S-A-L-V-E-S. It's considered, a salve is an unguent. It's soft and greasy and viscous. Uh, it's, again, it's topical. Uh, it, can it can be for healing. It can also be used for lubrication. Uh, salves are oil-based and anhydrous. They are usually made using an, inf an herbally infused oil. That's my favorite. Uh, wax and usually uh, various herbs or, and or essential oils. This has one of the lower wax ratios, so it's super slippery. Uh, it's not going to stick. And the softer consistency allows it to be absorbed more easily into your skin. So this is the best choice for healing things is a salve. You want something that's going to go on really smooth. Uh, if, if you're going to, it's also something that needs to be reapplied. I want to take a moment and talk about reapplying things. So a salve is uh, something we see for topical uses like burns. Uh, sunblock can also be considered a salve. It only works if you put it on. And it only works if you put it on repeatedly. So please do protect yourself as you see fit, but understand that it only works as much as you put it on. If you get it scraped off or wiped off or rubbed off or washed off, it, it's not gonna help you. So we have ointments. Ointments are softer and thinner, again, used mostly for medicinal purposes. It's uh, Similar in uh, makeup to a balm and a salve, but with much less wax. It's softer um, and usually has more medicine incorporated into it. Use that term as you will. They're typically almost like a lotion, and they're used for specific thing. You wouldn't find a general purpose ointment, for example. You might find a general purpose salve, but not a general purpose ointment then that's, that's a direct correlation to the level of medicine that's actually in the product. And liniments. I'm curious uh, as to how many people in this community actually use or create liniments. It's not a term that you hear very much anymore. Uh, it, uh, the definition of a liniment is something that's topically used to relieve pain in humans and animals. Uh, it's, it's a common term in the agricultural world <laughs> because we use it on animals, uh, but you can also use it on yourself too, depending on, of course, what it's made with. Uh, these involve typically a solvent, uh, which hazel or rubbing alcohol uh, that have been infused with herbs and are then added to the oils at that point. So the whole point of a, a liniment is it creates an actual sensation when you put it on your skin. So in addition to that cavalcade of uses for beeswax, don't forget, it can also be a component in soaps and scrubs. Uh, it adds all of the complex properties of the beeswax to whatever it is incorporated with. So it's always going to add, it's never going to detract. Uh, and that's one of the positive uh, components of beeswax. Not only that, it's a very, you know, cool use of bee products. So remember, eventually when you see that picture, you'll see they, they have to work really, really hard to make the wax. So treat it well, treat it carefully. Notice, note that there are different colors. It's almost white when they first make it and it becomes very, very dark over time. It's not an indication of the quality of the wax. It's just an indication of the age. Okay, so let's talk about propolis. It's not a Latin word. It's actually a Greek word. Uh, <laughs> it means, in, in Greek, pro means coming before or in front of, and polis is the Greek word for city or a body of citizens. 
but frankly, the, the, the bees don't speak Greek except in Greece. And by the way, there are great beekeepers in Greece. Uh, propolis is actually a bee glue. And it's more than glue. The bees use it for all sorts of things. Anywhere there's a rough surface, a crack, a gap, uh, they add propolis to it. Props propolis. Um, I say propolis. Am I wrong? So just for a moment, compare that earlier picture I posted of propolis to this nice, tidy little cake you can buy online. And let's talk about where it comes from. So honeybees don't generate this from their bodies. They collect it. So it's tree resin, basically. As trees bud, they exude uh, resins around the bud in order to protect it from uh, fungi and other diseases. So foraging bees use their pollen baskets now, now here's a Latin word, corbiculae, to carry globs of propolis resins back to the hive. Um, they do the same thing with pollen. They collect pollen, although it's a little, a slightly different process. Um, and the propolis is incredibly sticky, very, very sticky. It's, it's tree resin, but they uh, use it for all sorts of things in the hive. So propolis itself, contains over 240 compounds. As a matter of fact, there are things in there that we still haven't figured out what they are. As I mentioned moments ago, it's tree resin though. So depending on where you live, the content of the propolis is going to vary, uh, but they're all going to be complex, very complex. While the composition of propolis is gonna differ depending on the trees, it's primarily is 45 to 55% resins, and the rest is waxes and fatty acids. Uh, and that's what they, once they bring the resin back to the hive, they add uh, a little bit of wax to it to make it more uh, malleable, to make it more uh, manageable, frankly. So when it's warm, uh, propolis is sticky like chewing gum, but it gets brittle pretty easily and it will it, it's a, it's not super glue but it's pretty darn close uh, propolis has many different health benefits uh, lots of vitamins uh, b1 b2 b6 c and e and minerals like magnesium calcium potassium sodium copper zinc manganese and iron uh, 12 different flavonoids uh, and here's a really cool one. I'd like to know if anybody has heard of this one before. Pinocembrin. That's considered one of the primary ones. And these are the things that make it smell a certain way as well. They, they have properties with value other than the smell, but the smell is the, the big kicker there. As I mentioned at the end, I'm going to include not only all the references I'm using, but some uh, particular papers on all three of these topics. And it's it's interesting. I mentioned the bees use propolis for all sorts of things inside the hive. Is we also have the opportunity to use propolis for all sorts of medicinal purposes. It also so some of the properties medical properties of propolis uh, consist of antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antioxidant. It's good for your teeth and gums. It has synergy with antibacterial drugs. Um, so it's important to note that whenever propolis is taken internally, it will tend to be fully metabolized by the body after eight hours. So for best results, it's important to spread out the therapeutic dosage and take it at a minimum three times a day. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it's anti-cancer, going back to the antis. Uh, it, it contains a lot of things. We'll talk about tinctures in just a moment. So as always, I'll give my favorite disclaimer. I don't claim to be an expert in any of these, specifically the medicinal values of 
uh, beeswax, propolis, or royal jelly. But I will now talk about the potential negatives. They're similar to what we talked about when uh, we were learning about honey. So it's unusual to be sensitive to propolis. If you are, it will generally express itself as a dermatitis and it goes away. Quit taking propolis and it'll go away. Um, in larger therapeutic doses, uh, propolis can cause diarrhea for some people. But if you think about it, remember, propolis is primarily tree resin. And if you have an allergy to a particular type of tree, you might want to be careful about taking propolis. So the usual ways people use uh, propolis for medical purposes is in powdered or tablet form. You can take it straight up or mix that with honey. Uh, if you're gonna mix it with honey, use crystallized honey. Remember that honey that's almost solid and it's kind of creamy because they, they will separate. Uh, so if you're gonna mix it with something, uh, mix it with crystallized honey. So you're gonna powdered tablet or uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with tinctures and extracts. I feel compelled at this point to, to add something that we're not really going to talk about in great detail is how you use propolis topically. It was actually issued to British soldiers, I think in one of the great wars, uh, as part of their first aid kit because it was it has an analgesic uh, effect when you put it on your skin and it's also antibacterial and antifungal. So if you've got a cut and no Band-Aid handy or what have you, go ahead and smear some propolis on it. I've done it more than once. And yes, it really works. Also, I have a question about my uh, propolis. Um, I sent the picture above just so people have a reference. If you haven't seen tinctured bee propolis, I don't have any vested interest in that particular company uh, or anything like that. Um, but the question is, anyone who has this has probably noticed that, you know, if you have a dropper in your tincture, that dropper is going to be totally crystallized and so rock solid <laughs> and won't work anymore. Is there a way to clean that dropper out to or to dissolve it? You mentioned some some um, solvents earlier on. But you know, turpentine and all this. I don't. Is is there a way for regular folk like me to to clean out my dropper, um, and even to wipe off the the part where the the stopper meets the bottle so that it doesn't get stuck together um, with that tincture? So, if you're going to make a tincture or an extract which are the most potent ways to uh, use propolis. It's not always the best choice. It depends on what the in indication is. Uh, the, a, the standard recipe, if you will, is to mix two parts propolis by weight to nine parts of clear grain alcohol by weight. And we're talking about edible alcohol. So uh, vodka. <laughs> So mix it together in a lidded container, like a canning jar, or a little bottle, shake it and store it in a dark place. And it is easier to do this with, uh, with ground or powdered propolis. Uh, ideally, it's ground into a powder before making a tincture. It, it's basically done so you can maximize the surface area of the propolis uh, for the solvent. Your tincture, when... Uh, let it uh, let it sit for one or two weeks for best results, uh, and then recommend filtering it. That's not required, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Your finished tincture should be uh, clear and brown reddish color, and it's liquid, and it shouldn't have any junk floating in it. Now, propolis by design sinks to the bottom. It's heavy. Uh, so if you need a strong, after you've made your tincture and you think you need a stronger concentration, you can just add more propolis to that filtered tincture and it'll, of course, increase the dose. Now, there are some times you wouldn't use 
a tincture or an extract, uh, primarily because it's got alcohol in it. So you can also make an aqueous or hydrolyzed uh, propolis extract. Uh, water extracts are good. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't put alcohol in your eye, and you can use propolis to treat eye infections. Uh, you can either soak it or boil it, and some of the aromatics get lost when it's heated, but it still, it still has the majority of the properties that you're going to need. It's not like honey. When you heat honey, you lose a lot right away, but it's still honey. Uh, when you heat propolis, it, it's still propolis. Trust me, it's, you know, <laughs> it lasts a long time. Uh, once, you, once, you, once you're done soaking it, filter it as usual and uh, apply. You can also make an oil extract with propolis. Uh, if, you've, um, if you suffer from gum and mouth problems, uh, and this is also good if you need to use it topically on babies, uh, to, it's better to use an oil. It's just smoother, it goes on. So you heat your oil of choice, some neutral oil. I, I shouldn't say neutral oil. Olive oil is not by design a neutral oil, but I use it for everything. Uh, so heat your oil of choice with the propolis for approximately 10 minutes. Let it cool and strain it, and there you go. You've got your oil extract of propolis. Okay, so third and last on our hit parade of five products today. Game for royal jelly. Thank you, Rivka. All right. I just posted two pictures that I hope have come through in a timely manner of uh, things you may commonly see when you're looking for a royal jelly product at your local health food store or maybe the pharmacy, a cream and a capsule. Hang on, I'm going to stick one more up there. There. You also find it, you can also find it dried or dehydrated. So there are three forms that you would most commonly see royal jelly and your local purveyor of those sorts of products. I'm not going to post a picture of what it looks like in real life. So what is royal jelly? I'd be curious to know if anybody knows. Uh, but it is a white and viscous and <clears throat> jelly-like substance. Um, and it's created by bees. It's a secretion of worker bees, specifically nurse bees. Again, we spoke about them earlier. They're also the ones that secrete the, the wax at a certain point in their life. Uh, it's known for its protective effects on reproductive health, neurodegenerative disorders, wound healing, aging. There are all sorts of claims about royal jelly. I will neither confirm nor deny any of them. Royal jelly is very aqueous. It's mostly water, about 60%. It's about 18% protein and 15% car carbohydrates. There's some lipids and there's some mineral and vitamin content in there as well. And remember these, again, it's a substance, a secretion of worker bees. bees. All bees, all bees are fed royal jelly for the first three days of their gestational lives. So they start out as an egg and they become a larva and then a pupa. There's a metamorphosis that happens inside the cells. But the first three days of their gestation, from the time they're an egg to a three-day-old larva, they are fed royal jelly. So why is it called royal jelly? Because the queen, when the hive decides they need a new queen or they're lacking one, so they're going to create one from an existing larva, that larva will be fed exclusively, exclusively royal jelly for its entire gestation. I'm going to see. Yes, please refer to uh, number B or letter B, the two arrows there. Those 
peanut-like structures are queen cells. So they're bigger. Uh, and again, the queens are fed exclusively royal jelly during their gestation and actually throughout their lives, they get nothing but royal jelly. One of the, I won't say one of the reasons for this, but there, there are hormonal components also in royal jelly that create the queen from a normal egg, from a normal female egg. But also the queen herself, remember I said a worker bee only lives about six weeks in the summertime. A queen bee can live as long as five years. So she's hauling around a lot of genetic material. Royal jelly contains approximately 185 organic compounds. There are probably more. <laughs> it, it's got a significant number of bioactive compounds. Uh, it's, again, it's full of amazing useful stuff that we've only begun to discover through the uh, magic of science, so to speak. Uh, it's widely used as a dietary nutritional complex to help combat various chronic health conditions. And it's a known antibacterial, anti-tumor, anti-allergy, anti-inflammatory, and immunomodulatory effects. So if you suffer from chronic issues, uh, partaking of royal jelly will only help you and possibly enhance the effect of any medications you're taking. So as you may suspect, the process of harvesting royal jelly for medicinal use is pretty involved. <laughs> Just let me leave it at that. Uh, if you're interested in using royal jelly in your personal pharmacopoeia, if I mispronounce that, I'm sorry, uh, or for whatever purposes, I recommend, you're, you're welcome to contact me personally, and you can also use our friend Google to look up harvesting royal jelly. It's, it's a very involved process. Just let me leave it at that. There are apiaries that specialize in doing just that. So as with all things uh, bee, developing a relationship with your local beekeeper is critical to ensuring the quality, applicability, and ethical procurement of your bee products for, be it for personal or professional use. So again, do not hesitate to reach out to me and I will try and put you in touch with your local beekeeper or your local source for any of these things. Uh, local isn't quite as critical with propolis and royal jelly and beeswax as it is for honey, but it still helps to know where it came from because there are, there are some ethical questions that we all might have and are best addressed individually. So thanks again for joining us today. We loved having you and answering all your questions. Uh, make sure, you, please, you follow us on YouTube, on Instagram, on yeah, WhatsApp, on all sorts of social media. We're out there. Enjoyed sharing our outside space with you. Some of you are probably locked down in spaces uh, less prone to vitamin D exposure than most others. Uh, we have our great... A view in the background of the orchards where our bees are happy pollinators 
as well as our yard right here. And we really appreciate being able to share this with you. So please share us with others that you know, and we hope you stop by again. I can talk about these forever.